Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay. So American Thanksgiving is next Thursday. A turkey dinner happens to be my absolute favorite meal. Another reason moving to Canada has been a blessing because I get two Thanksgivings by living here. So I shared this with a friend of mine that turkey dinners are my favorite, and they said, oh, have you tried turducken? And I asked him, is that some kind of tofu vegan tempeh thing? And they said, no, no, far from it. Turducken is a duck stuffed inside a turkey. And I said, it sounds absolutely horrible. There's a chicken the, in there, too. There's a chicken in there, too? Oh, my gosh. Even worse. <laughs> for the turkey, for the chicken, for the duck, and honestly, for those eating it, it just sounds terrible. The very thought is offensive to the natural order of things. <laughs> it's just hard to wrap my mind around the turkey inside the chicken inside the duck or whichever way it goes. This week, I have felt very much like a turducken assaulted and assailed from all sides as though the natural order of the world was inside out and upside down. From Kanye to Kyrie, Kyrie to Chappelle, and then Wednesday, when for seven hours I was subjected, as Nico was as well, to the most hateful anti-Semitic and anti-Israel diatribes, grievances, and inherent biases during the debate over the IRA definition at City Hall. I feel like a turducken people shoving things down my throat that don't belong there. Anti-Semites have been living rent-free in my head for over a month, and it is time to evict them. It is time to clear the air on this whole anti-Semitism thing. So let's start with a history lesson. Anti-Semitism, though rising in fad and in fashion, is, of course, nothing new. So the basic facts, some history. Jews are the people of the Hebrew Bible. We lived millennia ago in a land now known as Israel. Jews believe that there was only one God, or at least since many Jews are not religious, it might be more accurate to say that Jews believe that if God exists, there is only one. Christianity emerged from Judaism. Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew who preached a singular religious message. The first Christians were Jews who prayed in Hebrew and observed the customs and religious rituals of Judaism. The Last Supper was most likely a Passover Seder. Jesus was put to death at the hands of Roman authorities under Pontius Pilate in Judea. But, and here is where it all begins, the gospel accounts were interpreted as blaming all Jews for his crucifixion. To his followers, Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, and so his death, sacrificial atonement. Therefore, accusing Jews of his murder was effectively to brand us as murdering God and to put a target on our backs that rested there for hundreds of years and even still today. Soon after the crucifixion, Roman armies destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and Jews were exiled and scattered to live as a dispersed minority spreading out from the Middle East to Europe and beyond. But some Jews remained in the land, settling in a southern coastal city called Yavna. It's where they wrote the Mishnah, the Jewish oral law. By the fifth century, Christianity had become the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. The early Christian church portrayed Jews as unwilling to accept the word of God. And illustrations show Satan binding the eyes of Jews, and some, churches, some church leaders intensified the charge condemning Jews as agents of the devil and murderers of God. Back to that murdering God thing. And that accusation, by the way, was not renounced until 1960s, when the Second Vatican Council officially repudiated the ancient charge that Jews had murdered Christ. For centuries, state and church laws restricted Jews, preventing them from owning land, holding public office. It happened right here in British Columbia, in West Vancouver, in the British properties. And guilds include excluded Jews from most occupations, which then forced Jews into pursuits like money lending, trade, and commerce. 
So excluded from Christian society, Jews maintained their religious and social customs, in part because they were not welcomed or embraced by their neighbors. In 1095 CE, Pope Urban II called for the liberation of Jerusalem from the Muslim Turks who had taken it from the Romans 400 years prior in the year 638 CE. Shortly after the founding of Islam in the city of Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia today. The Jews who remained in the land after the Muslim occupation of Jerusalem, they settled throughout the Holy Land. Some are cities that still exist in Israel today, including Jerusalem, Tiberias, Ramleh, Ashkelon, Kisaria. Those are all Jewish communities, and they were back then too. Christian crusaders set off to free the Holy Land from the Muslims. Many of these communities that I just mentioned, they fell in the path of the crusaders as they marched on Jerusalem, and they slaughtered thousands of Jews on their mission to capture the Holy, Sand, Holy, Holy Land. Throughout the Middle Ages, Christians persecuted Jews. Portrayed as alien, Jews were regarded as, as usurers, and it was said that Jews poisoned the wells of Europe, causing the Black Plague. Illustrations depicted Jews as the devil with horns and cloven feet, and showed them using the blood of Christian children in ritual sacrifices. These lies and conspiracy theories came to be taken as truth. They were fake news. But when and where they were needed, Jews were tolerated, even welcomed. When they were allowed to participate in the larger society, Jews actually thrived. In many places, secular and religious states forced Jews into segregated districts, later called ghettos. England, France, Spain, Portugal, and many German states expelled masses of Jews, most of whom migrated eastward into the Pale of Russia with their religious convictions, traditions, and the screenplay for Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> In 1517, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but the Martin Luther original, attacked the Pope and corruption within his own Roman Catholic Church. And that began the Protestant Reformation. The young Luther hoped that tolerance would persuade Jews to convert. But when Jews adhered to their own religious beliefs and refused to join his new reformed church, Luther's disappointment turned to hatred. And he proclaimed the following. Listen to this. What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? Their synagogues should be set on fire. And what does not burn must be covered over with earth so that no man will ever see stone or cinder of them again. Their houses should also be razed and destroyed and all their prayer books should be taken from them. End quote. 1500s, Martin Luther. The Protestant Reformation brought no end to the anti-Jewish traditions of Christianity. If anything, it just renewed it for another season. With the 18th century's enlightenment, emphasis on reason the domination of the church diminished. Some Enlightenment thinkers called for full rights for Jews, but on one condition, that they disregard or they discard their religious customs. Not something our people tend to do when told to. Others blamed Judaism as the source of a rational religious faith, proclaiming that our only one God and having a textual tradition that questions what God commands and demands of us is heretical thinking in a Christian society. It was then, and it still is in parts of North America today. Even though many Jews assimilated socially and culturally, prejudice did not disappear. In France in 1894, and you might know this story, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, the only Jewish member of the French Army's general staff, was convicted of passing military secrets to Germany. Later, proof of forgery confirmed his innocence, but Dreyfus remained the victim of a cover-up to divert attention from army corruption. And a century after the French Revolution proclaimed liberty, equality, and fraternity, giving Jews their freedom, frenzied mobs in the streets of Paris chanted death to the Jews. It's still chanted in the streets of Paris from time to time today. But at that time, when Dreyfus, a young Theodore Herzl and a young Henrietta Zold, witnessed this and convened the first Zionist Congress 125 years ago this past summer. 
They dreamed of the return of diaspora Jews to the land of Israel, the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. Religious discrimination had gradually changed into a thriving secular, political, and social hatred of the Jews. See how we switched from religious persecution to now social persecution. Nevertheless, freed from some restrictions, many Jews entered into the Christian world and became prominent citizens. And then around 1900, a new lie was promoted, that Jews conspired to dominate the world using their money and intelligence to manipulate trusting Christians. Russian secret police forged a document to support the, the story of a takeover plot supposedly authored by a conference of Jewish leaders. It's a proven forgery, but you know its name, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And it was nevertheless, and the reason you know its name, because it was translated into every major language and distributed around the world, it's still a bestseller today. Even though it's indisputable proof that it's a fake. To divert popular discontent at appalling living conditions and autocratic control, Russian authorities encouraged violence against the Jews, a distraction. Jews were blamed for the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. Pogroms and murders, rampages against Jews erupted in Russia many, many times during the next three decades. The second half of the 19th century saw the emergence of yet another kind of Jew hatred. At its core was the theory that Jews were not merely a religious group, but a separate race, Semites, set apart because of genetically inherent, inherited characteristics. And it was then, in the mid-1800s, that the term anti-Semitism was created to describe this latest form of Jew hatred based on genetic characteristics. We go from religious to social to genetic. Anti-Semites believed racial characteristics could not be overcome by assimilation or even conversion, and Jews were said to be dangerous and threatening because of their Jewish blood. Anti-Semitic racism then united pseudo-scientific theories with century-old anti-Jewish stereotypes, and these ideas gained wide acceptance. The devastation of World War I, the demeaning peace of Versailles, the hyperinflation of the 1920s, the depression of 1929, all of that fueled mass discontent around the world, and they blamed the Jews. The presence of Jews in Germany, cultural, economic, and political life made them convenient scapegoats for Germany's misfortune. Enter Adolf Hitler, Yamach Shamo, may his name be blotted out. Hitler viewed the world history as a racial struggle for survival of the fittest. And he saw Jews as the source of all evil, disease, social injustice, cultural decline, capitalism, all the forms of Marxism, especially communism. And so anti-Semitism would become the predominant theology of the Third Reich. After the Nazi takeover of power, anti-Jewish measures were put into effect one after another. Jewish businesses were boycotted, then seized. Jews were defined and separated from non-Jews. Jews were excluded from professions and studies. Jewish children were barred from schools. Jews were subjected to public humiliation. The Nazis took anti-Semitism to an unprecedented level of violence. Genocide, the systemic murder of millions of people deemed inferior, six million of them Jews. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, some Christian churches, including the Roman Catholics and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, they re-examined their teachings on the Jews and Judaism. The world felt guilty. What was left of the Jewish population of Europe joined the remnant of Jews that had remained in ancestral Israel, then called Palestine, a word, by the way, that's derived from the Greek word philistina, which dates to ancient Greek writers' descriptions of the region in the 12th century of BCE. That's where the word comes from, 12th century. Not BCE, BC, or CE, I should say. Yes, CE, CE, BC. Miraculously, against all odds, in fulfillment of dreams, of a dream, a hope of 2,000 years, the Jews returned to their ancestral land and established the state of Israel so that never again would Jews be without a home and without protection. And with the birth of the state of Israel came the latest mutation of this last acceptable hatred and oldest hatred in the world, anti-Semitism in the guise 
of anti-Zionism. As much as I'm about dialogue, and I am, I will tell you why, after the IRA vote, I turned down invitations to appear on CBC and other news media to debate with those opposed to the definition who I had to listen to for seven hours. Because it's not a good faith conversation. I'm going to use a bad word here in a moment. When a 15-year-old girl posts Shabbat Shalom on TikTok and is then flooded with trolls who are like, hashtag, free Palestine now, bitch. There is nothing in that exchange that has anything to do with an actual place called Israel. And I won't pretend that it does. It's anti-Semitism, plain and simple. Or to put it a different way, claiming you aren't anti-Semitic, just anti-Zionist, is like stuffing a duck and a chicken inside of a turkey. Once you've done that, they're inseparable from each other. So that's the history. Kanye, Chappelle, and all the others, they're just the latest in a millennia-long list of those that see Jews as other, as suspicious, as dangerous, or far worse. But we must not see ourselves that way. We must not look at ourselves through anti-Semitic eyes. We must not allow the haters to define us. As Barry Weiss claims in her book, if someone calls you a pig, you do not march outside claiming, I'm not a pig, I'm not a pig. Weiss claims that the way to react to anti-Semitism is not to grovel, but to live as a proud, self-identifying Jew. We need to live our Jewish lives in a very public way. We should proclaim not simply our love for Judaism, but our love for Zionism and Israel too. Zionism doesn't mean that we agree with all the policies of the Israeli government. Many Israelis disagree with the policies of their government during any given administration multiple times a day. And in a democracy, just like in Canada or the United States, when enough people disagree with what that government does, they vote them out of office. Zionism means the belief that the Jewish people, like the Canadian people, deserve a state of their own. And I will say this so do the Palestinians. And if they stopped claiming that the existence of theirs requires the destruction of ours, they would have had one already. When it was offered to them in UN partition, when it was offered to them at multiple peace talks. And so here is my answer to anti-Semitism. When the anti-Semites stand on the street corner, or the freeway overpasses, or the steps of City Hall, and they hold up signs that say, it's the Jews, my answer is, damn right it is. It's the Jews, and the world is a better place because of us and for us and our very existence. We cannot build an identity based on worrying about the attitudes of others towards us. We must focus on what we stand for and shape a positive, hopeful, joyful, authentic Jewish identity from that place of social conscience and moral responsibility. I am proud of our people. Proud of how, in spite of our meager numbers, we have made meaningful and transformative and life and world-saving contributions to society. I am proud of our traditions, proud of our theology, proud of our ideology, proud of our customs, our practices, and our culture. I am proud of Israel, how it made the desert bloom, how it's a functioning democracy, maybe more functional than most. It's had four elections in five years, or five elections in four years. They don't even know. They can't keep track anymore. <laughs> And sometimes I'm embarrassed by Israel. Sometimes I'm infuriated or ashamed by its policies or its actions, but I'm not responsible for them. And as I told the city council on Wednesday, I have no more influence over what happens in Israel than I do in Great Britain. But its right to exist is not up for debate. The rabbi of a local congregation asks an elderly congregant if she saw a certain article in the Jewish magazine. Oh, I don't subscribe to that anymore, she says. Which magazine do you read then, the rabbi asks. I read The Klansman from the KKK, answers the elder, elderly woman. The Klansman, blurts out the rabbi, that hate-filled, white supremacist, vile, no good rag, you read that? How can you bear to have that filthy thing in your home? You should understand, rabbi, says the old lady. I'm old, pain keeps me up at night. 
When I read our Jewish magazines, they tell me that anti-Semitism is on the rise, that arguments about who is a Jew are tearing our people apart, that intermarriage destroying the fabric of our people, and that the loss of our younger generation is accomplishing the decimation that Hitler, Yamach Shemo, had always wanted. Oi, 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 Rabbi. I read our magazines and I stay awake all night with worry. But when I pick up a copy of the KKK, The Klansman, I read the Jews control all the media, that their power grows every year, that banks and international finances are in their hands, and I sleep like a baby. <laughs> Friends, sleep well tonight. As Taylor Swift sang when Kanye disrupted her MTV Music Award acceptance speech back in 2009, haters gonna hate, so shake it off. Shake it off. And when they say it's the Jews, we say, damn right it is, and aren't they frickin' amazing? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.